We are Wayne State University. We are Wayne State University. We are Wayne State University. We are Wayne State University, and we are changing the world. We made an indelible contribution to a city, to a nation, and to the world. Just like we have for nearly 150 years. We're made up of some of the smartest, smartest and toughest, the most tenacious, persistent, and innovative students who have ever sought knowledge. We live on campus. We commute. We're local. We're national. We're, we're international. international. We're the most diverse student body in Michigan. That's important because if you want your point of view to be understood, you better learn to understand another. Better learn to understand another's. We've accomplished a lot in one year. We made an economic impact. We made a we medical made a impact. Medical impact. We made a social impact. We made a social impact. We made a scientific impact. We made a impact. scientific impact. We made an academic impact. We made a local impact. We're recognized by the Carnegie Foundation for having very high research activity. The National Institutes of Health awards us grants that improve the lives of thousands of babies and moms globally. We're one of only three universities only in the state. Only three universities in the state who are part of the University Research Corridor. We make discoveries here that aren't being made anywhere else in the world. Anywhere else in the world. Beyond our 200 acre campus of green space and walking paths, you can have Detroit. Threshold to the great big world. Great big world. We'll put our experience up against any other. Because long before there was a movement to save the city. Way before it was cool to wear t-shirts that said Detroit versus everybody. Before the hipsters, the slow rolls, the lofts, the brew pups, and the segways. There was a place that was thought provoking. Unapologetic. Hands on. Learn as you work with no excuses. A place that said, here's your chance. A place to invent. Or reinvent. To experiment. And produce. To take some knocks. But never break. But never break. That place was and is Wayne State University. So from us to you. Welcome to Wayne State. And remember, always aim higher. Aim higher. Aim higher. Aim higher. Aim higher. Of course, the 20th century uh, art history, I don't think there's been one single artist that has done so much to absolutely, remarkably bear her soul for the entire world to see. And Diego Rivera, of course, we all know who he is, um, referred to her work as a form of agonized poetry. I think that's a brilliant description of her work. And so, <clears throat> Frida was able to take that, that agonized life, a very short life of 47 years. She suffered greatly, both physically and emotionally. But she was able to take that pain and suffering and turn it into a source of inspiration. And it was painting that gave her life meaning. Uh, she was able to take the pain and suffering and execute it in the paintings for, for everyone to see as a means to come to terms with all of the issues that she was going through. Um, and she painted because she had to. She had no choice. I mean, either that, it was either that or she probably would have rolled over and died. I think most people probably would have done that, given what she'd gone through in her life. Um, <clears throat> so, um, let's talk about the pain and suffering. What did she go through? Well, beginning at the age of six, she was diagnosed with polio, which caused one of her legs to be uh, somewhat smaller than the other. So she had one thin leg and one normal-sized leg which later on she covered up with her very, very long, colorful dresses that, that of course, Diego loved. Very, very Mexican, indigenous-style dresses that are referred to the Tijuana style. And, uh, but when she was younger, she was teased quite a bit by her fellow classmates. In addition, at the age of 18, she had a terrible, horrible accident when she was riding on the bus on the way home from school with her then-boyfriend, the bus collided with a trolley car, and it left her crippled for the rest of her life. Uh, in addition, she had three miscarriages, which was absolutely heartbreaking because she absolutely uh, wholeheartedly wanted to have a child. And it was absolutely heartbreaking when she finally realized that, primarily due to the accident, her body was so messed up that she would never be able to, to bear children. And that was very, very much a major, major disappointment. And last but not least, <laughs> was her relationship with Diego. She had this you know, tumultuous relationship with her husband. Everyone knows he was quite the womanizer. She, of course, had her own affairs, some with men, some with women. But their life was, uh, was like their own telenovela. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely a classic love-hate relationship. 
but it wore on her. I mean, Diego was still the love of her life, but yet she recognized that he could never really be married to anybody. Yet on the other hand, when she died, Diego aged very, very quickly. And he realized at that time that, and in, and in fact he said that, he, he realized that, that uh, Frida was the most important thing that ever happened to him in his life. And three years after her passing, he passed away at the age of 70. So how was Frida able to deal with her pain? How was she able to do that? Well, she did it because she was tough. She was a tough cookie. Um, she was tough as nails. Um, she smoked, she drank, she swore just like the men. She was rebellious, she was a communist. Uh, she didn't take crap from anybody. She hated pretension. In particular, she hated the type of pretension that comes from people that are usually very affluent or wealthy or aristocratic. She loathed, for example, the Ford family. She hated Henry Ford and stuck it to him verbally from time to time. While they were dancing, there was an incident where um, she asked him quite blatantly, Mr. Ford, are you Jewish? <laughs> of course, knowing full well that Henry Ford had a very bad reputation for being anti-Semitic. And of course, at that, he, he just sort of laughed and chuckled. He was like, ha, 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 oh, you are a pistol. <laughs> But that's the way she was, and um, her spirit was relentless, and she just kept on struggling and rising above her pain and suffering. Um, before we go off this slide, let's take a look at this face. <laughs> Personally, I think this is a very beautiful face. Others would probably say, well, she's not really beautiful, but she's attractive. I think she's beautiful. <laughs> Either way, I think you have to agree that this is a very compelling face. It's iconic. I think there's probably not another face ever that is as iconic as Frida Kahlo's face. Um, it's, it's a very arresting, very, very, um, very severe face. And of course, she is known for her uni eyebrow. It's sort of like part of her signature appearance. And of course, her long, very colorful, brightly colored costumes. <coughs> Um, but her, her face is everywhere. She's, she's such an iconic image. You see her face on the sides of coffee cups, on refrigerator magnets. Um, people dress up like her for Halloween. You know? But we can't let that sort of kitsch overshadow her contribution to the art world, I mean, which is, I think, significant. All right, um, it was very hard for me to, to try to choose particular works that I wanted to talk about. Like, how do you talk about somebody's life in a period of 30 to 40 minutes? It's impossible. But I had to choose, <laughs> I had to make some selections. So I chose this painting because this is a very early self-portrait. And it's significant, it's significant because this is one of the first paintings where she began to embrace her sense of Mexicanismo, her sense of Mexicanness. And you can see it in the style of dress. You can see the, the, the necklace around her neck. It seems to be pre-Columbian in nature. The colors are a little bit brighter than, than some of the earlier self-portraits that she, she made, which were kind of European and, and austere and, and, and kind of cold. Um, <clears throat> but the thing I love most about her work is her work seems to be paradoxical to me in nature. There's, there's an element about her work that reminds me of folk art. It's, it's a little bit primitive. And you can kind of see that there's not a heavy, uh, a, a, a heavy amount of modeling going on. There's not a, a lot of uh, three-dimensional form being, being established here. In fact, everything is really relatively flat. You know, especially the blouse goes into almost like a whole flat shape. Yet at the same time, she's got the elongated neck, the stylized elongated neck, which comes from her love of Botticelli, Sandro Botticelli, you know, the famous Italian master, the Renaissance master. Um, so there's a kind of combination of, of, a, a, of a bit of a sophistication and primitivism happening in, in her paintings. In addition, 
her paintings can have such a raw, intensive gutsiness, yet at the same time, it's, it's vulnerable. At the same time, you're sort of like painfully aware of her pain, yet at the same time, her work is beautiful. And so it's that kind of fascination that keeps me coming back to her work and looking at it closer and seeing different times, uh, seeing different things every time I come back to it. <clears throat> now this, this, is, uh, this, <laughs> this painting has an interesting side note, I, I should tell you this. In the year 2000, this painting sold for $5 million at Sotheby's in New York City. It sold to an American collector and it was uh, the most that anybody has ever paid for a Latino artist. And it may still hold the record, I'm not sure. Okay. This is a photograph of, of Frida that was taken just prior to her arriving in Detroit. You can see she's painting a portrait of the wife of Diego Rivera's right-hand man, who's his right-hand uh, technical assistant. But what I wanted to point out is when she's working on this image, you've got the image here, and you've got down here, you see this on the bottom here? Yeah. You've got text, you've got writing. Now this comes from her love of retablo painting. How many people have heard of retablos? Anybody know what that is? A retablo is a form of Mexican painting, it's folk art, and it's basically a votive painting. It has a religious connotation, and it's usually done when somebody survives something miraculously. So somebody survives a heart attack, and so they give thanks to the Virgin of Guadalupe for saving them against a, a, a heart attack, or they survived a very serious operation or a car accident. And so they make this, this, this votive painting. It's usually painted very crudely. Uh, they're considered folk art. They're usually done on tin, and quite often she paints on tin. And so this is a format that she, she loved, she adopted. Uh, she and Diego collected hundreds of these, hundreds of retablets, which we'll see some of it in just a second. But I wanted to show this, this too because you kind of get the scale of her work here. It was never really quite big. She maybe did a couple of large paintings in her entire lifetime, but most things are very, usually very small because she was primarily confined to a bed, especially the last 10 years of her life. She practically planted everything on her back in a horizontal position. And this is a pencil sketch of the accident uh, Quite often she would do pencil sketches to get ideas for paintings. She'd just sort of work out a composition in the form of a sketch. And uh, this shows the bus being collided with the, um, with the tra trolley car. And the interesting thing that, that happened later on is she found this, which is an example of a, a retablo painting that very, very closely resembled her own situation. And here you have the bus being collided with the trolley car. There's Frida down here on the ground. She made it her own image by putting in the, the uni eyebrow. Uh, she changed some of the writing on the sides of the vehicles, like the, the bus says Coyoacan, where she lived and grew up, and the number of the trolley car that collided with the bus. And then down here you have a description of what happened. Um, and it says, uh, the married couple, or Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Guillermo Calo and Matilde Calo, give thanks to the Virgin of Sorrows for saving their daughter from the accident that occurred in 1925 in the, on the corner of, and then I can't read the name of the corner, it's like Kuwaku de Maikan or something like that, Icasado. They something. <laughs> Doesn't matter. And so she made it, she found this retablo and she made it her own. And so um, here is another example. Now, this is one that I own. This is actually my collection. I was able to purchase a few of these when I was in Mexico some time ago. And this one um, has something to do with the boy ringing the bell in the church steeple, and the wind came along. and blew him off balance and he fell to the ground and miraculously he, he survived and didn't even get hurt. 
And these are on tin, and they're really quite small. Like this one's probably about nine by nine inches in size. So everyone knows that, that, that Frida and Diego were in uh, Detroit from 1932 to 1933. Uh, of course, Diego Rivera was here to paint the industrial murals, which he, by the way, considered his absolute best masterpiece. Okay? <clears throat> he painted these murals for 11 months. And frankly, I think, when you think about the work of Diego Rivera, this is his strength. Not so much his easel paintings, although I like those too, but his ability was his uncanny capacity to work at a large scale and to work very, very quickly. And if you know anything about uh, fresco painting, you have a very limited time period of when you apply pigment into the wet plaster because plaster is gonna dry. And so he was, I think, an amazing artist from the standpoint of being so incredibly facile. I mean, it was fast, and he could just draw up a storm. And uh, you think 11 months is a long time, but when you go back over there and look at the complexity of that image on all four walls, it's not very much time at all, I don't think. And so that was Diego's strength. Diego's strength was the fact that I think he was the greatest muralist painter to ever live. And I compare him to all the rest of the Mexican muralists. I mean, I love Orozco and Siaqueros and all those guys, but I, I, I think that, that Rivera is the king in that regard. And when you compare his work to Frida's, Frida's strength, I think, was doing work that was small-scale easel painting. But when you look at her work, her work, I think, is so much more compelling on a psychological level. It just, like, pulls us in. Why? Because I think as human beings, we can identify with her pain because we all experience pain in our own lives. And so they were very, very different artists. And if you would ask me, which is your favorite artist, it would be hard for me the main one. They're just, I think they both have their strengths, and they're both um, incredible. And it's interesting that they lived over in the, what's now the Park Shelton, almost walking distance from here. And at that time, it was called the... Wardell. Wardell. <laughs> the Wardell. And uh, Frida actually set, set up a little space to in the apartment for her to, uh, to paint. And um, I love this paint. I love this photo. I thought I'd throw this now. And Basil, the kiss. Now, the most significant thing about Frida being here in Detroit, because this is really where Frida started to do her most significant deep psychological works. And it was in Detroit where she really decided that she was going to be a full-time painter. And the reason being, and, and because there were some circumstances that happened to her that I think caused this to happen, okay? This was an early painting that she started. I'm showing you this because it gives you a sense of her process. She started out very, very thin, with very, very thin layers. You can see she's kind of like just staining the canvas. This, by the way, is one of the few paintings that she actually did on canvas. Most of her works are actually done on smoother surfaces, like, you know, masonite or, um, or metal. Um, but here you can see where she's like laying down very thin layers of wash. You can see her oil sketch, the linear approach. She's like getting her composition down. Um, and this was a painting that she did to, I think, address her sense of hope and her sense of fear. Yes, she really wanted to have children, but she was also deathly afraid of having children because she thought she was going to die in, in childbirth, given what she had gone through with the accident. So the doctors here at Henry Ford Hospital told her that she could probably carry the, the pregnancy until the very end and give birth, but she would have to be, uh, she would have to give birth via cesarean section. And so she started to do this painting, but unfortunately she had the miscarriage before the painting was finished. And then she saw no need to finish it because she was just absolutely heartbroken. And uh, she went on to other things. And the other thing that she went on to was this painting. Five days after she got home from Henry Ford Hospital, she started this painting um, that, of course, very directly addressed her miscarriage. You can see Frida here <clears throat> on this very enigmatic floating bed with very odd perspective. 
she's bleeding, she's holding these like um, what seem to be ribbons, but I think to me they represent more like umbilical cords, cords that, that sort of connect all these uh, symbolic images. The, um, the snail represents how slow the miscarriage was. Here's an image of um, the embryo here is, uh, or the fetus. Here is her idea of female anatomy. This is, uh, uh, represents the machine that kept her alive. You know, it could be the miscarriage. Representative. Um, is this a, a, was a gift from the no, no. uterus as well. And of course the pelvis, which was damaged so, so drastically when she had the accident. <clears throat> Now this is a tough painting. Um, she was so down and out from the miscarriage that she was just depressed and she was just spending all this time in bed. And it was actually Diego that came along and she said, he said, you know, you've got to snap out of it. You know, you've got to do something. You know, get up and start painting again, please. If you don't know what to paint, uh, at the very least, maybe start by painting some very important events in your life. And this was the first painting that she did in that regard. This is the first painting that represents her birth. I mean, what more could be more important than your own birth? And this is Frida's birth, or how she put it. It's like, this is my birth as I imagined it. So here you see Frida. Clearly it's a self-portrait with the uni eyebrow across her forehead. Um, her mother is, is actually covered up, which sort of signifies that the mother has actually died, which actually her mother did die when she was in Detroit. And she had to go back and visit Cleo Khan while she was here. Um, above the bed, you have a, um, an image of the Virgin of Sorrows with tears and little spikes or nails sticking into her face and skin, uh, as if to say there's no hope for this situation here. And in fact, there really wasn't. It was more prophetic in nature because she was never ever able to have children um, in her lifetime. Now, down here, you can see where she had a scroll already set up to actually write something in that decided that she didn't want to write anything in there after all. I mean, I guess what more could be said after looking at this tough image. By the way, this is, uh, this is a painting that's owned by Madonna. Did you guys know that? It was in the news recently. The DIA tried to get this painting back for the, for the exhibition here, and Madonna would not part with it. She would not part with it at all. <laughs> Which is surprising because usually collectors are very generous when, when it comes to lending works of art for very, very large and special exhibitions, but no, she wouldn't park with it. Another little tidbit is like Madonna has this hanging in her home, and she uses it as a test. If she's inviting somebody new to her house for dinner, if the person likes the painting, she judges that person and says, okay, if you like this painting, then you can be my friend. If you don't like this painting, you'll never be my friend. So if you guys don't like this painting, you will never be Madonna's friend. Now, now is that Frida's coming out and then her mother died? Yes, it's Frida coming out and her mother died. But my, her mother did not actually die in, in childbirth, but, but her mother did die when she was here in Detroit. Okay, another very important painting that Frida did when she was in Detroit what is this one called? Self-Portrait on the Border of Mexico and the United States. By the way, she referred to the United States as Gringolandia. <laughs> and here you have Frida pictured uh, in the middle of the composition holding a Mexican flag signifying where her allegiance happens to be. On one side you clearly see a uh, very lush, um, a very rich cultural landscape of Mexico with the Aztec or Mayan ruins in the background with organic uh, fruits and vegetables, flowers in the bottom left-hand corner. Clearly on the other side you have uh, Detroit, an industrial place, it's gray. You have the American flag being engulfed in the smoke from those smokestacks. And there's a, there's a great um, contrast between one side and the other. She was very, very homesick. And she hated Detroit. <laughs> Sorry to say that, but she thought it was ugly, she didn't like the people here. Um, but on the other hand, too, she, this is like the third year that she'd been away from, from Mexico. And 
if you've been to Mexico, I, understand, I can fully understand that. If you've ever been to Mexico, it's very, very colorful and lively. And the culture there is incredibly strong. And if you've ever seen images, if you've ever been to Coyoacan, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a typical area of Mexico City. The, the, the buildings are brightly colored. There are flowers everywhere. There's vegetation. Everything is green. It's lush. Uh, people are hanging out on, on the outside of their houses. They don't come indoors and draw their shades and watch their TVs at night. I mean, everybody's out and they're socializing. And, and I think that she really missed that lifestyle after a certain point in time. Okay, you know, the thing that's interesting to me is when you think of Frida's face, you think of such an iconic image, and you think of that she is like the quintessential face of the Mexican woman. Yet at the same time, her father was Hungarian-German Jew, whose family migrated to Mexico when he was 19 years old. Um, and I don't know why, I just imagine it's probably they wanted to go someplace neutral, someplace away from from Europe, where people didn't um, have such negative feelings toward Jewish people, to just, you know, escape persecution. <clears throat> so this is a, um, another painting that she did, documenting some important events in her life. Here you have Frida, standing in the courtyard of La Casa Azul, the, the, the blue house where she grew up in Coyoacan. And on this side, you have her mother of Spanish and uh, indigenous ethnicity. Uh, this is young Frida in the womb. And here you have uh, the maternal grandparents pictured on top of a landscape that's clearly arid, but yet Mexican, okay? On the other side, you have Guillermo Calo, who original name was, um, was Bilham which is the equivalent of William in English. And of course, his parents are pictured on top of an ocean to signify that they're from across the ocean. They're from, from, from Europe. Uh, I just wanted to ask you quickly. Oh, real quick. We'll do the two names. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, throw the, I thought I'd throw this in because this is um, another one of the strangest paintings that she's ever done. <laughs> Uh, just simply entitled, My Nurse and I. You know, Frida was never close to her mother. And um, it's probably one of the reasons is she, felt, she rebelled against Catholicism. And her mother was very sort of rigid in her philosophies and ideas. Um, and the fact that she could not be nursed by her mother because her younger sister, Christina, was only born 11 months after her birth. So they had to hire uh, an indigenous woman to be a nursemaid, who, by the way, was later fired from the job for drinking on the job. Um, and so you have this odd figure. You know, you have the baby, yet you have the head of an adult, a Frida, that signifies that it's the adult that's actually having the, rec recognition, uh, the, the recollection. And yet she couldn't remember the face of the nursemaid, so she decided to put this like funeral mask, which is a, like a Mayan or pre-Columbian funeral mask on the face. And it's just a very, very odd painting. And I think it, the painting in general represents the lack of intimacy that she had with her mother. And there's not much intimacy in this gesture here either. If you look away and come back, you know, you might think that the nursemaid's going to drop her completely on the ground. <laughs> Here's another scroll that she had put on here with the idea that she was going to write something but she decided not to at the last minute. This is the kind of device that she used quite a bit in her work too, this sort of wall of vegetation that you see repeatedly happening in her later self-portraits as well, and I, and I really like that. Okay, I'm, I'm throwing this in because I think that this is one of the things that I think represents the more classical side of her, her painting technique. Frida had a, a most remarkable ability to capture one's likeness. She was a brilliant portrait painter, without even trying. 
And honestly, if I didn't know this was her painting, I thought I probably would have thought it was uh, was Diego's self-portrait. It's almost done in in, uh, in the style of Diego, which is not rare to think that you know somebody that you live with would be influential on your work. You know, you kind of feed off of each other's style from time to time. But I, I love this this portrait of him. It's just really a very good likeness. And not too many people know that she did many, many still lifes. You know, we always know her self-portraits. I think that's the most popular thing that, um, that she's done. But even these still, still lifes are very edgy. You know, the perspective is weird. You know, if you're looking that much down on a table from above, it's doubtful that you're going to see a sky in the background. Okay? And so the sky in the background just throws you off completely. It just never allows you to fully relax in, in, her, in these paintings. She would also do things like, you know, some violent things. She'd sort of injure the fruit, cut them open. Um, this is prickly, prickly pear fruit here in the middle. Um, and they also have sort of sexual references, too. Now this painting has an interesting story, done in the Ritalgo style. Um, this is called The Suicide of Dorothy Hale. Now Dorothy Hale was an actress and a Ziegfeld uh, showgirl who was really, really down on her luck and decided to commit suicide by jumping from her high-rise window. And uh, a friend of Dorothy's was trying to commission Frida to do a portrait of Dorothy Hale that she was going to give to her mother. And Frida came back and said, well, how about a, how about a, a recuerdo type of uh, painting? How about a, a, a memory uh, kind of painting? And uh, this is what she came up with, which is a very, very graphic depiction of the suicide with a uh, description on the bottom here that says, um, in the city of New York, on the day of the 21st day of October of 1938, I guess, um, at six in the morning, the Dorothy Hale. I can't read it. She threw herself from the window. I think, yeah, from the high rise of the building. It was called the Hampshire House. And um, in, in your memory, this portrait, I can't read it, painted by Frida Kahlo. So it's, again, you're using text and imagery together. Well, she gave this to their friend. Of course, her friend was absolutely horrified. <laughs> and was actually contemplating, uh, she was contemplating on destroying it. Of course, she could not give that to her parents because then her parents would be horrified. It would just add to uh, salt of the wound, right? <clears throat> so they kept it. Uh, her friends, uh, friends of uh, the woman that commissioned the painting, com convinced her not to destroy it. And I think at one point she gave it. He gave it away, and then the guy kept it for years, and then he died and gave it back. And then one day it mysteriously showed up on the doorstep of the. Uh, Museum of Art, in, uh, I believe in Arizona, and I think it's there. Now, in the Phoenix Art Museum, thank you, right there. Okay, this is one of the largest paintings that Frida Kahlo has ever painted. There was one other one that's actually made, maybe like six feet in width. This one measures about five and a half feet by five and a half feet, and it's called The Two Fridas. And this was a painting that she did after her divorce from Diego Rivera. And she was absolutely crushed. Um, on one side you have the Frida in the Tijuana costume. This was the Frida that Diego loved. You can see she has a whole heart here. In her left hand she holds an amulet of Diego when he was a little boy. From the ambulance comes this like weird vein that passes through one heart over to the other figure into the heart down here. 
where the other Frida, who's dressed in this more lacy European costume, represents the Frida whose heart has been broken. And here she's trying to cut off the, 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 uh, the blood with the sutures, but it's still bleeding and there's nothing that she can do about it as a re representation of her helplessness. You see this device, too, in the background where she likes to paint these clouds in a stylistic way. To me, they almost represent more like fi fissures in the earth rather than clouds as a further indication of her pain. An interesting little tidbit of this painting, this is a painting that she sold uh, to the um, Instituto de, de Arte Nacional de Mexico, the, the National Institute of Fine Arts in, in, in Mexico City. She sold it for 4,000 pesos. Now 4,000 pesos in 1947 was worth about $1,000 US. And so out of curiosity I thought, well, what's $1,000, how much is that worth today? So I looked it up, and it's worth somewhere between twelve and thirteen thousand dollars. And I got to tell you, in the big picture of things, that is not very much money. That is not very much money at all. That's what an incoming artist in New York, in a New York gallery, would probably that'd be like a starting price for a young, unknown New York painter in a gallery in, uh, say, Chelsea or someplace like that. So she had some recognition throughout her lifetime. She had like three major solo exhibitions. One in New York at the uh, Julian Levy Gallery, which is a very, very um, prestigious gallery in its day. They showed primarily uh, photography, um, contemporary photography at the time, and uh, surrealism. And then she had a very important show in Paris, and then one in Mexico City. But I gotta tell you, you know, throughout her lifetime, Though she did achieve some success, i got to say, it's nothing like the popularity of her work is now. And in 1970, when the Tejuana style, the, um, style of painting called Me Mexicanismo started to gain popularity, her work just took off. And it's been taking off ever since. And it keeps on growing and growing in popularity. And this is another painting that she tried to, where she was trying to deal with the pain of the divorce from Diego. Incidentally, she was divorced from Diego in uh, 1938, but they remarried again in 1940. And unfortunately, the marriage wasn't any better the second time around. <laughs> it was just as bad. It went bad right away. And so you have her enormous heart on the ground. Its size uh, is significant of how much pain she was suffering at the time. Um, you have this pole that's been stuck through her heart. You can see it's empty. There's no heart there because it's down here. On the one side, you have a childhood dress that might represent the days that she remembers of when she met Diego, when she was in the uh, when she was in school. And of course, on this side, we have the Tejuana style dress that she was so popular for. And she's actually wearing a kind of European-style clothing because it, just to spite Diego, she started dressing in European clothing. She cut her hair very, very short just in spite because Diego loved her long hair. And she, you notice she doesn't have any hands, okay? The fact that she's pictured without any hands signifies her sense of helplessness. You know, there's nothing she can do to change her, her destiny. This is one of my all-time favorite uh, Frida Kahlo paintings. I absolutely love this painting. I think it's just completely wholesome and whole and um, it's just perfectly balanced. <clears throat> um, well, why do I like it? I, I, I like it for so many reasons. I love the, the necklace of, of thorns. It's almost as if she's taken Christ's thorns uh, crown of thorns and reconfigured it for herself and put it around her neck. The dead hummingbird here, her wings, the wings in this position sort of echo her, the wings of her eyebrows. Uh, the symbolism of the dead hummingbird, those were sort of like good luck charms to sort of get lucky in love in, uh, in Mexican mythology. Here she pictures her pet monkey and one of her pet um, 
black cats that looks a little bit ominous and threatening. Um, the butterflies are kind of a symbol of transformation or metamorphosis. And again, you have the wall of vegetation just directly in back of the portrait. Uh, this actually comes from her love of André Rousseau, the post-impressionist primitive painter, the folk artist. Yeah, it's, he, she loved him, and Diego loved him as well, and so you can see a little bit of Rousseau in this work here. But the thing that I love most about this painting is her expression. Here it's almost as if she's not even looking at the viewer anymore. She's sort of like kind of glancing down a little bit. She's a little bit melancholy. She, it's almost like she's engaged in thought. It's a very, very um, enigmatic expression, and uh, I don't know, I love it. And of course, this one, people probably know this one very much so. I mean, it's called The Broken Column. Here you have <clears throat> her body, which has just been ripped open to show how much she's been damaged. And she's pictured the damage by the use of this symbol of the ionic column that's been fractured, fractured in many places. places. <clears throat> Here you can see where she's um, pictured herself in this metal corset that she had to work to wear in the latter portion of his life because it seems like it was only, the only thing that was like holding her body together. It must have been terribly uncomfortable, but she needed that support because um, her spine just wasn't working, it wasn't functioning anymore. Um, and then of course you could see the pins and the needles sticking into her flesh, further symbol of her pain and suffering. Here you have these fissures again, only this time they're happening in the landscape. So of course she's weeping. I gotta tell you, I didn't, I, I didn't go into too much detail about her, her uh, how are we doing for time? Um, I didn't go into too much detail about her accident. Let me just tell you what happened exactly. Um, <clears throat> the driver that she was, uh, the bus that she was driving, um, the driver thought that he could turn in front of this trolley and actually make it around the corner. Well, that didn't happen. He turned in front of the trolley, and the trolley wound up broadsiding the bus. And at that time in Mexico City, the buses were made out of wood. And the bus was actually quite elastic. And the trolley just kept right on going, and it literally ripped the bus right in two. And what had happened was uh, a railing had dislodged from its location, and literally literally pierced Frida in the back, it entered her back, and exited out her groin area. It fractured her pelvis in three places, fractured her um, spine in three places, punctured her uterus, she had two broken ribs, uh, multiple fractures in her leg, broken collarbone, and uh, and I think that's enough. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's enough physical damage for any one human being. In fact, I'm surprised she lived. The doctors were surprised she lived. And the bizarre thing about this accident is, for some odd reason, it must have been just how much she was tossed around in the bus before she was actually literally thrown up from it. Um, there was something about all that jostling around that, that disrobed her. And so there she was, in the street, She's practically nude. She's been impaled by this handrail. She's bleeding to death. And the, and the bizarre thing was that there, 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 there was someone riding on the bus that was probably like a house painter or a craftsman or someone that painted you know, frames for fine art. But they were carrying a, a container of, of gold dust, of gold pigment. And during the accident, that gold dust just went everywhere and it splattered on her body, and there she is, lying on the ground, she's bleeding to death, and she's golden, and she's naked. What an utterly horrific and bizarre sight that must have been. I just can't imagine. Someone that was an innocent bystander came along, said, we've got to get that pole out of her. They pulled out the rod, or the railing, which I don't know if I would have done that, that might have been something really bad, like, you know, something that could have, like, sped up the bleeding. But in, in any event, she did recover, and she was able to, to walk again. Um, but later on, she would have multiple com complications, and uh, she was constantly in pain, 
sometimes would be bedridden for one, two, three months at a time, and consequently learned to paint on her back, which I don't know how she did that, but I think it's just remarkable that she was able to, to develop that technique. So, um, here she is, painting on her back. The easel was actually made, uh, had, uh, her mother made her this special easel that allowed her to do this. You know, I always tell my students too, it's like, why are you sitting down? I, I don't even like my students sitting down in my painting class. It's like, you gotta stand up. If you stand up, you're, you're, you're mobile, you can use more of your motor skills, um, you can stand back, see what you're doing, get close, and you know, get a better sense of what's going on. And, um, but she did this, you know, and so I, I think it's remarkable. And here's yet another painting, you know, I, I jokingly refer to this as like, if St. Sebastian were a deer, this is what it would be. And here you have simply another representation of her expressing her pain and sorrow. <clears throat> Uh, using her pet deer, by the way, as a, as a model. Incidentally, because she could not bear children, she had um, constantly this like menagerie of, of animals that, that surrounded her. She had a pet deer, she had numerous dogs, cats, she had a pet monkey, um, numerous parrots. I think she just wanted to be surrounded by living things. She was an avid gardener. Um, so this is another very strange but interesting thing. And this is yet another poignant painting where she's trying to address the pain that she had when she went to New York uh, to get a surgery, one last surgery, and she had very, very high hopes for the surgery. It was supposed to actually resolve all of her problems, but unfortunately it was a batched, botched operation. And uh, the title of this is Tree of Hope Remains Strong from 1946, Oil on Masonite. And here she's like uh, sitting and holding the flag, and it says in Spanish, Arbo de la Esperanza, mantente firme. Okay, on one side it's daylight, and you have the representation of the sun. And here you have the, the scarred Frida here. The sun is representative of uh, the Aztec uh, blood sacrifice. And on this side, you have Frida in the nighttime with the moon above her, hovering above her, uh, the moon being a symbol of womanhood. Here she's holding her corset, which she hopes to break free of one day. And uh, again, the fissures in the ground, very stormy, stylized sky. <sighs> And this is the, the last painting that she did in her life. And it was a still life, obviously. She did many still lives toward the latter part of her life. <clears throat> and shortly before she died, she, she must have thought that death was imminent. She went back to the easel one last time and painted these words. And this says, Viva la vida. Frida Kahlo Coyoacan. 1954, Mexico. She died in 1954 at the age of 47, and uh, a few days later she passed away. Okay, this is the last slide I have for you guys, <clears throat> and while we take a look at this slide, I want to just read you uh, some words of uh, from Frida. <clears throat> She says, the only thing I know is that I paint because I need to. I never painted dreams. I painted my own reality. I paint whatever passes through my head without any consideration. I paint self-portraits because I am so often alone, because I am the subject I know best. I've done my paintings well, not quickly, but patiently and they have a message of pain in them. I am not sick, I am broken, but I am happy to be alive as long as I can paint. Thank you.
And then you get to that one portrait of Diego, and it's a very self, very, very straightforward portrait of Diego with very little symbolism, very little um, imagery that's sort of happening in the background. It's, it's just very, it's like a single image. And my, I, this is just me guessing. I think that, that she was learning from her husband in terms of painting techniques. And that's why I thought that this was probably Diego's work. You know, this would be something that Diego would actually do. Frida was absolutely very much a feminist. And the most incredible thing about her was she was a feminist without even trying. I mean, this was years before the term feminism was even coined, right? And you know, the, ma the amazing thing about Frida is she, she accomplished what she accomplished in a world that was occupied and controlled by men. There's a very, if you want to read an excellent biography, uh, the, the, the quintessential biography of, of Frida, uh, a woman by the name of um, Haydn Herrera, and uh, it's a very, very good biography. She also wrote uh, a sister book that simply is titled, and this is one I read, I didn't read the biography, but I read the, the other book, the sister book that's called Frida Kahlo, The Paintings. So that one too has a lot of biographical information in it, and, uh, but it focuses on, on the paintings. Oh, she's coming at the DIA? Perfect. Check her out at the DIA. Hayden Errada. All right, well, we'll do one more question. I think I saw a hand right here, right? And then we'll... I got a question about, like, her background, like, schooling and her inspiration. So basically, background schooling, inspiration, where she... Uh, well, she was born and raised in Coyoacan. Uh, which is a section of Mexico City. Uh, she attended one of the finest schools in Mexico City called the, um, what was it called? The, it was like a preparatory school. Um, the, the very best school that you could have gone to. And there weren't that many uh, girls going to that school at the time. And that's actually where she met Diego, because Diego was actually commissioned to do a, a mural inside of her school. And you, if you saw the movie, you know, she approached him and she would tease him and steal things out of his lunches. It's like, hey, Diego, come down see my paintings, you know. That's how they met, essentially. Um, but I, I, the reason I think that, that she could speak Spanish, uh, English is because she could read, and she could read both in, in French and English as well. So she had to be able to speak. So, I don't know about Diego. I think Diego probably spoke a few words. But anyway, you know, did Diego Rivera speak English? He said yes. He spoke English. He did? He had to work with uh, the Rockefellers, yeah. Okay. Give it up for Professor, Professor Melrose for a second, please. Woo! There are many, many events going on throughout all the next three months that are all surrounded by Frida. So if you want to get your Frida fix, go ahead and keep tuned for the next Knowledge on Tap as well, because they are always interesting.